Okay. Good morning, everyone. I welcome you all to the international webinar on public health, women's agency, and peace building, women's right, recognition, and protection during COVID-19 pandemic. The topic for the day is inclusive public health, gender impact, and stakeholders' role, a global perspective. I am the student coordinator for the day. My name is Muskan Puri, and I'm a student at the law school, University of Jammu. There are certain guidelines for today's session. Kindly adhere to them. Firstly, anyone who has a question can ask it in the chat box and kindly mention the question is directed. Secondly, all the participants, they are requested to fill the feedback form as certificates will only be given to those who fill these up. And the feedback form will be released in the chat box 20 minutes prior the session ends. So kindly look that space for the purpose. The moderator for today's session is Dr. Monica Narang. She is currently a teaching faculty in the Law School, University of Jammu. She has graduated from the same institute and has done her doctoral research in the field of new horizons of fair hearing in India. Her areas of concern include international law, law of torts, property law, human rights, among others. A major part of her illustrious path has been studied by being associated with many human rights and other non-governmental organizations where she has contributed to the best of her acumen. In July 2019, Dr. Narang got the prestigious opportunity to become the founding member of Asian Association of Law Professors. Throughout her career as a faculty and as a member of various organizations, she has participated and presented various research papers in national and international conference seminars. Touching the lives of her students, colleagues, and individuals alike, she has always been part of the endeavors that have established her as an illuminating academician. I now request ma'am to kindly take over. Please, ma'am. Thank you, Muskan, for the nice lines. I welcome one and all in the technical session 1B on day three of this international webinar organized by the law school, University of Jammu, Yakcha Reconciliation and Development Network and International Civil Society Action Network. The topic of the panel discussion as already discussed uh, by Mustan, that is inclusive public health, gender impact and stakeholders role, a global perspective. On the ongoing pandemic, COVID-19 crisis, which have effect different ways, and in order to resolve uh, that, we must take gender into account. For women and girls are vulnerable in the home, on the front lines of healthcare, and in the labor market. Regardless of where one looks, it is the women who bear most of the responsibility for holding societies together, be it at home, or in healthcare, or at school, or in caring for the elderly, all these jobs. In many countries, Women perform these tasks without pay. Yet, even when the work is carried out by the professionals, those professions tend to be dominated by women, but they tend to pay less than male-dominated professions. The COVID-19 crisis has thrown these gender-based differences into even sharper realm. Regional frameworks, multilateral organizations, and international finance institutionalized that women play a critical role in resolving the crisis that measures to address the pandemic and its economic fallout should include a gender perspective. Women and men are, they are different as regards their biology, the roles and responsibilities that society has assigned to them and their position in the family and community. These factors have a great influence on causes, consequences and management of diseases and ill health. Thus, Healthy and conducive environment, healthy lifestyles, community involvement and participation, access to essential facilities need to be addressed. These differences between men and women, boys and girls in an equitable manner in order to be effective. Now, I invite and introduce the chair of the session, Ms. Archana Kapoor. She's a community media specialist and independent filmmaker and author. She is the founder of Seeking Modern Applications for Real Transformation, a not-for-profit that works with marginalized communities in India. In 2018, she launched the first ever radio festival in India with a mission to celebrate some. In 2010, in an effort to democratize information, she found Radio Mewat, a community radio station in the most backward and pre-pondrantly Muslim district of India. 
the radio station has won two national awards and its achievements and stories of change have been widely reported by national and international media her work is focused on the minority regions of assam a state in the northern eastern part of india moism impacted areas of jharkhand extremism impacted kashmir and in backward and muslim area of haryana which are most uh, some of the most challenging geographies in india she is also a member of the international board of the association of women in radio and television now i hand over uh, to take the proceedings of the session to Wait. madam archana kapoor please ma'am uh, first of all a very good morning to all of you thank you arshima for bringing such eminent uh, making me chair of a panel with such eminent women i am delighted and privileged to have with me this very very powerful uh, women only panel and such powerful voices i was going through the bio datas and the profiles uh, words are not enough to describe the kind of work that they have done the struggle uh, visakha maryam uh, even monica everybody else josie uh, uh, luna you know everybody on this panel has so much to share unfortunately we are restrained by time but i think ashima this is just the beginning yakja is doing great work uh, we have you know you worked in jammu i worked in srinagar at the same time on different projects doing different things uh, doing same things differently i would say and with the common mission we have worked together uh, our whole mission is to give women their due and i think that is a struggle that we have all been engaging in and with uh, i won't take much time but i just want to set the tone of this discussion seeing the kind of wide experience that all of you bring in of course your presentations will talk uh, and share a lot more but for me covid 19 has been one of the most trying periods like for most of us but also a learning period you know we have learned so much about the inequality about inequity about discrimination about the police about the law about how they look at the state when there is this kind of emergency so for me covid 19 is not only a health pandemic it is a social and economic catastrophe it has revived old fears and spawned new ones that has turned the world into one of the most dangerous places like what do you see beyond the world it is the most dangerous place and the women are the worst hit now this calamity is progressively undoing all the gains that women and the underprivileged had made in the past hundreds of years and is threatening to bring back a world which if i may quote thomas hobbes would say nasty brutish and short though women are the worst sufferers in such catastrophes but say for a few countries no one has really asked them their views lockdown that many societies have imposed is so masculine in construction and implementation we have seen the blunt edge of the state being used to enforce a lockdown unmindful of how women will deal with this enormous burden that is falling on their shoulders many of them have been forced to give up their jobs to tend to the old and children cook food and do all the household work and as it happens in a country like india they have walked shoulder to shoulder with their husbands and children to return to their villages at times more than 1000 kilometers away i'm sure most of you have read these stories and have been following the plight of the migrants and then there is this fearful spike in domestic violence which the women have to bear silently in lockdown homes where they are forced to live with their perpetrators there is no one to listen to their cries as the police is busy with surveillance of lockdown the helplines are dysfunctional on account of mobility and for only essential services the shelter homes have been evacuated now in this kind of situation the lockdown and covid has presented new challenges to women and they would soon have to organize and mobilize to protect their rights to uh, their rights to find their rightful place and that they had earned or they were about to earn after years of hard struggle of course when we look at you know our panelists mariam and luna and uh, and uh, um, uh, vishakha we know 
or that you know they have the kind of struggles which they must have gone to reach where they are must not have been easy and they must have been now looking at other battles for the new generation but the fear of this covid is that they have pushed back quite a long way you know we have rolled back many 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 years and you know the women have had shown the courage and strength and resilience to not only just fight the disease but protect themselves and also their families to ensure that the new normal of this pandemic doesn't throw them back uh, through dark ages but even today when we all know and no one better than asha and all of you have been fighting for a place for women in peace building efforts efforts and conflict zones whether it is our own country or in across the world whether it's sri lanka or uh, maldives or other places but we had struggled so much and now we don't know how much time we will take to actually come back and take our rightful place now emergencies we all know are hard for women but nothing like the covid 19 has ever been experienced before that we all know being confined to home means being confined to household chores and to domestic violence to less independence to constant surveillance and of course needless to say loss of dignity we believe that women are fighters and survivors and they will not only fight this disease but they will again become anchors for their families and communities and for their societies as we learn to live with this disease we must not forget that it is not only a disease it is an entire uh, bouquet of things which is going to be thrown at us in which we will not be given the place and therefore this seminar this webinar today becomes very important because we have to use this crisis as a tool for transformation of a world for uh, to become a better place forever now this is an opportunity i see for all of us women who have learned so many new things they have become better negotiators have learned technology have started interacting with people at a equal level without fear because the distance is so much that you know you can say what you want to say so i'm also looking at it as a very positive um a situation where we can take advantage of it and this is an opportunity for us to reexamine our power together to bring back peace to give us our place and to become a very powerful voice and put it in the hands of those in gloria stenham's words hold up half of the sky and that is women so with these words i would like to uh, now you know uh, i think that uh, what i have said is just starting of this discussion but i'm sure our panelists are going to add a lot to it so it gives me indeed a lot of pleasure to introduce our first speaker uh, uh, vishaka dharmasa and uh, just give me a moment i'm just going to the profiles yes uh, miss visakha uh, dharmadasa is uh, from sri lanka she is going to bring forward to us a sri lankan perspective on emergence of women as stakeholders and the challenges that they have faced during covid 19 Uh, but before that you know i must share with you uh, her uh, profile which is absolutely stunning and inspiring miss visakha dharmadasa is the founder and chair of association of war affected women and parents of servicemen missing in action in sri lanka she also works on disseminating the content of un resolution 1325 on women peace and security she trains women to run for political office and also on power sharing this is so important in today's time she was awarded the prestigious humanitarian award for 2006 by the interaction of washington dc an ngo consortium comprising of 160 non governmental organizations in coordination with the 1000 peace women across the globe movement she was nominated for a collective nobel peace prize in 2005 she was a team member of special rapporteur to look into the violence in north and east of sri lanka and the cease fire violations by the human rights commission and consultation task force on reconciliation mechanisms appointed by the government of sri lanka she is a network member of women waging peace a founding member of women's alliance for security leadership a member of the expert pool of resolution to act as well as a member of the global network of women peace builders as well as a senior member of women mediators across the commonwealth 
She is the gender focal point for GPPAC in Sri Lanka, a director of the Board of National Peace Council and PAFFREL of Sri Lanka. She was also a member of the Civil Society Advisory Group of UN Women for the region. Visakha Dharmadasa holds a degree in negotiations and mediation skills and in women and security from Harvard University, Cambridge, USA. Uh, Visakha, I am so delighted to be introducing you and having you in this discussion. Um, there's much, much more about you and the internet is full of it. I think all our participants should Google more and seek inspiration and strength from women like Visakha. Thank you, Visakha, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, for your kind words. And good morning to everybody. Thanks, uh, Ashima, for giving me this opportunity. I'm really delighted to be here. Visaka, I have to correct you. I am Archana because I work on misinformation <laughs> and other things. So I'm forced to correct you. Sorry for the interruption. I'm Archana Kapoor. Thank okay. you. Sorry, I didn't interrupt you. OK, ma'am. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'm just going to give a glance of the Sri Lankan health system and where we are and what the women have done. So the Sri Lankan health system, though pluralistic, is dominated by an allopathic approach. Early organized systems of care provision began with the initiation of the health unit as the basis for community-based care in 1926. Alternative health care methods such as Ayurveda and traditional healing were functional even at that time. Currently, the allopathic system encompasses curative and preventive health care throughout the decentralized management approach that operates throughout the country in the public sector, while the private sector provides services according to the market demand. The health system has been incremental changes over the years and was largely set up during the time when communicable disease were prevalent. The government healthcare delivery system is free to all citizens at the point of delivery, and it has been the commitment of successive governments of Sri Lanka to maintain this policy. Sri Lanka has 1,100 government-run hospitals throughout the country, and 960 of these provide primary health care. Every divisional secretary division has at least one government-run hospital and medical clinics run by the government is situated in the close proximity so that people even in the remote areas of the country can access. Also, government medical officers are established in every divisional secretariat division which provides public health inspectors as well as public health nurses and midwives. Each village do have a family health servant. Normally, she's a midwife who visits houses to, from house to house she goes and also provides services to pregnant and lactating mothers. Apart from these, there are private hospitals, there are Ayurvedic hospitals in every uh, district and private hospitals in major cities and also privately run government clinics in every city of the country, I mean every small town of the country. More than 95% of the nurses are women and also all family health care servants are women. Sri Lankan people generally are very health conscious and personal hygiene is a major concern of a family. Each and every house do have a toilet and also people do boil the water before drinking. Especially, I must say, women play a crucial role in these aspects because the mothers take all necessary to boil the water, to get the fed the firewood, boil the water, and put it in, in a decanter and give the children. So these practices as well, when we think of the COVID situation, we believe that good personal hygiene practices and also tradition of isolating oneself during disease such as chickenpox, measles, was very helpful during COVID quarantine. We do practice complete isolation of the patient. We believe that these practices as well drinking coriander tea, using margos and neem pata, because we use neem pata always when we have contagious disease and also turmeric. When I was 
it's more like I'm grounded. And a teaspoon of that with a bowl of water was given to me in the evening by my mother to spread around the house. And then we burn the incense before worship. So these practices, I believe that helped us to, uh, uh, at least uh, for the moment to cur uh, curtail or the curb of uh, COVID up to this extent. If you take Sri Lanka as a glance, uh, we have confirmed cases 2,839 from that. 2,537 have already recovered and 11 deaths as of today. Now, if I speak a little, I must tell Madam Chair, we the women of Sri Lanka, especially the women at grassroots level, the women leaders, the local level women politicians did play a crucial role. They did play a very crucial role during uh, COVID lockdown, especially in my area and also elsewhere. They are the ones who contacted the bakers, the uh, grocery, the vegetable sellers, and got them to bring the food, the essential foods, to the doorsteps of the people. I mean, this was amazing because they used to sell, now the uh, bread van is crossing the bridge, now it's in your area. So they used to call people, they also posted in Facebook. And also, they collected prescriptions from the elderly people in the villages. And then one person went to the city, to the pharmacy, and got the, down the medicine. And also the government, uh, what they did that if you were registered in a government hospital, uh, they sent, used the postal services to deliver the, the, the medicine so that the people don't have to go out of the houses. And also the women did use the smartphones. I mean, I can distribute it to us these visuals, uh, guidelines from the World Health Organization and also the local authorities health guidelines, the women use their smartphones to disseminate. And also, not stopping at that, they also stitch face masks. They also distributed face masks as well um, soap. And uh, a very special case that I remembered, in fact, two of the women they, they got curfew passes and went like 200 or more kilometers to rescue a woman from domestic violence. They went and met the judicial medical officer, got that report, went to the magistrate, got a restraint order to the husband and managed to bring that woman to her house in, in Western province from the North Central province. So women did play a crucial role and they are playing a crucial role during this pandemic. Um, um, I do agree totally with you, Madam Chair, that this is a new norm. But also, as you told, the positive side is that, that people have started looking at plants, the trees. I mean, the way of living that we had before, before this whole modernization came into, now the people are really going back. Because also during this pandemic, women also distributed fertilizer, they distributed seeds, and everybody had the home garden. Because, I mean, at least if you have a jack tree and a coconut tree, you don't have to worry about your food. So that is the status in Sri Lanka. I'm going to stop at that. And then I'm really open for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Visakha, for giving us an overview of your health uh, systems and the institutions that came to the fore and handled COVID so well. You have, uh, in your uh, very short and very precise uh, uh, talk, emphasized that women can play a role under all circumstances. Nothing is going to hold them back. If there is a will, there's a way. And they took the lead. They realized the need of basic necessities, whether it's medicine, whether it's food items. They were monitoring, and they are capable of using uh, smartphones to help a larger audience. So thank you so much for that. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions waiting for you uh, soon in the chat box. But um, I think, uh, would our moderator like to say something now? Or would you like to, uh, our rapporteur say something now or say it at the end? Josie, our respondent. Ma'am. Hi, everyone. Uh, yep, can I, I say something? At the end, that's OK. OK, you'll be speaking. Yeah, and even I'll be asking questions in the end. OK, sounds good. Thank you so much. Uh, so now it gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Um, I'll just again go to that. So we have with us now our second speaker, Luna, Dr. Luna Casey. 
Uh, she is a gender specialist. Uh, she's going to speak about COVID-19 and gender inequality in Nepal and the emerging patterns thereof. Luna Casey is a PhD. She is an independent researcher. She has a background in international relations. Her research addresses issues of women, peace and security, gender and development, women and war, feminist politics and post-conflict transformation. Her work has been published in, uh, in peer-reviewed journals, including International Feminist Journal of Feminist Politics, Conflict, Security and Development, and Journal of Asian Security and International Affairs. Um, it gives me great pleasure to hand over the mic to you, Luna. I look forward to a very enlightening talk from you. Over to you. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. 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 Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, and it's uh, great to be here. First of all, um, I would like to thank uh, the chair, uh, all the speakers. Uh, thanks to Dr. Monica for moderating this event. Um, and much thanks to MS Gardner, th thanks to great audiences, uh, and very special thanks to Asima for inviting me and um, giving me this platform where I'm able to share some of my thoughts. So, <laughs> so as, yeah, so like since the, the start of this international webinar, we have been talking about um, diverse effects of COVID-19 in our society, in our everyday lives uh, from gender perspective. Uh, and just adding to that, uh, today I'm going to speak about how the COVID-19 worsened gender inequality in Nepal. Uh, so basically I'll be focusing two areas, um, rising gender-based violence um, and uh, heavy unpaid care duties and domestic work. And along with this, I'll also put some um, forward, some critical questions just, just to think about it. Um, so to prevent the coronavirus, uh, Nepal was uh, like uh, other nation. Uh, the, uh, the country was under the full lockdown from March uh, 24th to June 15, 2020. And now it's almost completing five months. And as of today, the country has um, 22,000 plus confirmed COVID cases and 65 plus deaths. Uh, so the growing data <laughs> demonstrate that since the outbreak, reports of violence against women and girls, mostly domestic violence has uh, got, uh, has risen. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the gender-based violence was uh, already a growing problem uh, in Nepal, even prior to COVID. Uh, so, uh, so like uh, U UNFPA suggests that 48% uh, 40, uh, 48 of the women in Nepal had experienced violence uh, at some point in their lives with 27% uh, of them experiencing physical violence and 61% of them had never told anyone about the abuse. Uh, and with since the locked uh, COVID-19 uh, with physical distancing and isolation measures, many women are forced to stay with their abusers. Uh, they are also unable to seek immediate services. And this has even uh, has risen in the reporting of the gender-based uh, gender violence. And at the same time, the, the response from the government is very discouraging, uh, discouraging uh, such as uh, quarantine facilities are, uh, facilities are very poor and very unsafe for women. Uh, so, for example, recently there was um, quite uh, coverage in media about a young woman who was raped, uh, gang raped in the quarantine center. Uh, and, and this is really frustrating. Um, and the Women's uh, Rehabilitation Center is one of the quite recognized center in Nepal and which reported about uh, 465 cases of gender-based violence just between 24th March till 12th May 2020. And this is really an alarming number. And the number is likely to grow after more organizations make their uh, uh, GBV data public. 
so the National Women Commission also reports that every 10 minutes a women somewhere in Nepal dials 1145 helpline uh, operated by National Women Commission uh, seeking assistance. So the majority of these calls um, are made by survivors of domestic violence who are either seeking um, or either looking to report incidents of abuse or calling to inquire about the support services offered by the groups. Uh, so women and girls are also facing a challenge uh, to find out the right uh, information, like, uh, you know, like due to social media and, you know, fake news and disinformation, even they are becoming a victim of uh, social media as well. So in some cases, they are unaware where to go and report. And if they know, they are also fair to disclose if possible that um, services centers do not have enough space or resources uh, even to accommodate the rising cases. Uh, having said that, uh, despite limited resources, uh, local organizations and women groups and youth are already taking steps to support um, gender-based violence survival, uh, survivors, so such as uh, like ASA Crisis Center is operating 24 hours uh, helpline, uh, in the, uh, such as like providing therapy sessions, referrals, and also uh, Child Workers in Nepal is another a national NGO, which is also providing, you know, helpline and uh, therapy sessions for children. So another major challenge of um, gender-based violence is getting a real data, uh, and uh, as few victims rep report the abuse. The core cause for this is the stigma associated with being a, a victim, a tendency to blame women and girls for their own assaults, and the importance of the family honor, all of which uh, victims and families, uh, prevents victims and family from reporting. And, uh, you know, like uh, uh, it has been like a long time since reports has shown that uh, women and girls have a long term impact. Uh, uh, um, so, sorry, so the gender violence has a long term uh, effect on women and girls, uh, such as fear suicide, social stigma, even mental stress, and etc. And in case of Nepal, with this growing rate of uh, gender-based violence, um, this might put women and girls' everyday performance uh, and further deteriorate their uh, gender inequality in the time of COVID and also, the, in, and also aftermath of COVID. So the question is uh, now uh, how silence is becoming as a form of acceptance uh, in, in, in our community. And so how can we dismantle this? So I think we have to really think about this. And this is just a question I, yeah, I was thinking about. Um, so the next uh, point is uh, heavy unpaid care uh, duties and domestic work. Uh, women and girls around the world spend total of 12 0.5 billion hours on unpaid care every day. And if we look at the data of Nepal, women spend 4.5 hours extra than men every day on unpaid work. So this is uh, due to deeply rooted patriarchal social norms uh, that pressure women to take on domestic duties, have put the burden of caring for children and the elderly, including the bulk of household chores on the soldiers of women and girls. And now with this uh, coronavirus, uh, school closures, leaving um, millions of children stuck at home uh, has significantly raised their workload. And this might prevent them from spending time and resources on education, training and skill development. Uh, and, and many women in service sector and their jobs cannot be worked from home. Uh, are even facing, uh, you know, uh, extreme um, uh, crisis and women and girls, uh, particularly living in poverty from uh, disadvantaged caste group or in rural areas, isolated locations are even more vulnerable and likely to face extreme consequences of this uh, pandemic. Um, so like, uh, you know, the unequal lab, uh, gender division of labor has been long identified as a factor causing inequality with direct link to lower income, 
uh, education and access to medical services for women. So here, uh, the danger is that a uh, heavy workload uh, accelerated by the COVID-19 crisis could leave women and girls further behind in Nepal. And also evidence from the earlier pandemics suggests that uh, women are at uh, particularly risk, uh, uh, especially girls are at particular risk of dropping out and not returning to school in the aftermath of pandemic. Um, and, and women uh, especially might face even worse economic uh, insecurity in the aftermath of the crisis as uh, for finding work is already more challenging um, for women than for men, as, as also the COVID has taken away many women's jobs because uh, they were mostly working in informal sectors. And it is uncertain whether or not uh, women will regain those lost jobs once uh, their normal to returns. And it is also highly likely that uh, women who had entered uh, non-traditional roles uh, prior to the pandemic may roll back to traditional roles in the post-COVID-19 uh, uh, era. So, so I'm so you know, like I, I was thinking about so what uh, is to be done in order to uh, you know meet these challenges. Uh, so. Uh, I think like gender recovery plan should be, uh, you know, um, should be there. Uh, so, so how this uh, gender uh, economic recovery uh, plan looks like would be a record of uh, disintegrated data on COVID-19, uh, not only about the infection rate, but also the distribution of the care and domestic duties, both paid and unpaid, incidents of gender-based violence, gendered impact on education, as well as economy and gender employment status, uh, and as well as other social impact. Um, not all women uh, face the outbreak in a similar way due to the differences among women and diverse gender categories and uh, an intersectional lens must be applied while formulating gender policy program amid the COVID-19 crisis uh, to ensure that everyone gets the support and services they require. Um, uh, to respond to women and girls' urgent needs, both during and after the pandemic, there must be a more women and girls involved in the policy making of the COVID era, for example, in the agenda setting, formulating policy options, um, budgeting, um, decision making, and policy implementing. And, and, and this time, women not, must not only be at the table, but uh, serve as the leader of the table. So um, now, like, you know, I'm almost uh, at the end. So what I would like to say is that, like, we are already seeing, uh, this is not the first crisis we are seeing. So, you know, we have been gone through various disasters, conflict and all pandemics and, and, and repeatedly often um, women and girls face uh, greater risks and they are systematically advantaged. So given the complexity of uh, intersecting social and cultural factors um, that discriminate against women and girls, uh, where can effort be focused to begin deconstructing these existing forms of operation in the scope of both short and long term solutions? So this is just my thought and let's think about it. Um, yeah, so I, I just, I wanted to end here and I'm happy to take any questions, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Luna, that was very oh. illuminating and it seems you were talking about India or any other country. You, know, <laughs> the is that you may be a woman anywhere in the world, but your right. story are very similar. So right. I think that, you know, what I do is uh, you raise some very pertinent points. I have written them all down and in my wrap okay. up to save on time, I will take it up there. So uh, okay. I will now invite our uh, third speaker, uh, Mariam Shakila. Let me just introduce her. Um, you know, uh, it's so good. We have social activists, we have academicians, and we have even people with political background in this panel. Thank you, Ashima, for putting in so much effort in putting this panel together. So um, I, uh, it's a deep honor to welcome Dr. Mariam Shakila, who's been a former cabinet minister in the government of Maldives. She was handling environment, health, 
gender family and human rights, as well as the foreign ministry. Uh, a perfect combination for this discussion, I would say. She's been the former chairperson for executive board of WHO, which is the World Health Organization. Besides holding diplomatic positions, Dr. Shakila is also an honorary consul of Belgium and Maldives, former council member of IRENA, which is the International Renewable Energy Agency, uh, International Executive Council member of SARC Chamber of Women Entrepreneurs Council. She has also held portfolios in environment and energy, gender, family and human rights, climate change, health and foreign affairs with over 30 years of experience nationally and internationally serving in, the, in both the private and the public sector been a businesswoman, an entrepreneur, a lecturer, a teacher, and as an academic, she is a well-known figure in the Maldives society, as well as internationally. She is also the CEO of Simdi Group of Companies, heading diversified businesses engaged in varied sectors from trading, hospitality, education, medical, and mental health. She's also a member of two advisory boards of the prestigious Curtin uh, University, and chairs the board for executive education and MBA. A very active civil society group uh, member, both nationally and internationally. She is also linked with prestigious institutions such as ICANN and WASL. Um, I think uh, Maria and uh, Visaka have a lot in common, especially the institutions that they are linked with. So I would like to now welcome uh, uh, Dr. Maria Shakila to take over the floor and uh, give us her insights on this pandemic and women's role in peace building. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair Archana Kapoor, Professor Seema Sharma, Dr. Monica Narang, and student coordinators, officials from the university, and my friend and my good friend and colleague, um, Ashima. Thank you for the opportunity to present perspectives uh, from Maldives in regards to the pandemic. As Madam Archana mentioned, COVID-19 pandemic is not just a health issue, um, but an intense shockwave to our societies and economies, and it has prompted us to think out of the box. Now, COVID-19 is already testing us in all fronts, economically, socially, and emotionally in unprecedented ways, challenging our values, our strength, our spirit, and shared humanity, and highlights critically a criticality of women's participation and employing the measures stressed in UN Security Resolution 1325. Most people know Maldives as a remote archipelago of 1,200 tiny islands whose isolation and outstanding natural beauty have long been a great draw card for tourists wanting to get away from it all. Almost 100% dependency on uh, this resource is actually um, at the heart of what is happening in Maldives in relation to COVID-19. From early March, when complete lockdown was imposed to control the spread of the corona uh, virus, tourist arrivals have fallen to almost zero. This has impacted many businesses and households even beyond the resort sector. Firms have been forced to lay off their workers or put them on leave with little or no pay, while sole traders and small businesses have lost much of their regular income. Although resorts have opened up as in source markets are limiting tourist arrivals. And of course, as we all know, in all these uh, cases, um, women are at the heart of uh, suffering. Being a very small island nation with a population of um, only 557,426 uh, sparsely dispersed across 188 islands, Maldives faces numerous challenges, making our experiences very particular, disproportionate and unique because of the high exposure of our economy to external shocks, challenges pertaining to the geographical dispersion of the islands and the almost total dependency on tourism. Maldives has a non-discriminatory health policy and various institutional provisions for inclusivity. Just like all of us, we all face challenges when it comes to implementation. 
So Maldives healthcare system is provided by the public sector and which operates in a centralized hierarchical system where health service delivery is organized into a 40 year system with island level primary health centers graded into grade one, two, three, and four, based on the operating um, house, a higher level of health facilities graded as hospital grade one, two, and three, uh, respect to provision of maternal and newborn care at the at all level, especially the care hospitals at the region, usually consists of a group of two to four at alls. Apart from providing a curative care, these hospitals and health centers provide public health services through public health units. The sole provider for tertiary care services in public sector is Indira Gandhi Memorial Hospital at the center and central level in capital city, Mali. So according to the World Bank and Asian Development Bank, Maldives is recognized as being one of the worst hit from the pandemic in proportion to the economy our population and space. The pandemic is also revealing uh, escalating um, escalation of prevailing inequalities based on spatial disparities, changing rural and urban dynamics, and critical needs of particular vulnerable groups, despite an impressive economic uh, growth trajectory, which uh, the country was enjoying. Changing political undercurrents, uneven uh, development, high rate of internal migration to the capital city uh, and the greater Mali region adds to overcrowding while the vulnerabilities and needs of women, children, elderly persons with disabilities and those living in some remote parts of the atolls are affected creating unhealthy social divides and discrimination. The significant migrant population, which is said to be the largest proportional uh, population of international migrants in South Asia, representing nearly one third of the resident population, which at the moment stands at at least 145,000, um, is a complicated matter too. And this is a particularly vulnerable group where a significant proportion of workers are either irregular or undocumented and are facing severe risks of being exposed to COVID-19, losing, uh, losing their livelihoods and being exposed to various forms of discrimination, stigmatization, human trafficking, and leading to confrontations and violence. In fact, they became the super spreaders because of the unacceptable congestion and living conditions. With the lockdown and borders closed, mobility was restricted and it meant that several generations of people were confined for days and weeks in very, very small spaces together with children who were off to, um, who were off school, leave struggling to balance childcare, household work and paid employment with a disproportionate burden placed on women as we all know. Prolonged coexistence with the uncertainty and anxiety, income loss and other psychological effects is increasing the number of cases of violence against women and their well-being, sexual exploitation and abuse, their sexual and reproductive and mental health. Apart from these immediate issues and exposure to the weaknesses of the healthcare system, the pandemic's long-term economic ramifications are also likely to disproportionately affect women's to men limiting their ability to re-enter the labor market and, um, and, and that will constrain their economic autonomy. Women's vulnerability affects family income and food availability and will lead to malnutrition, especially for children, pregnant and breastfeeding women. And many women with violent partners were deprived of support because of the current social distancing, uh, confining circumstances and disrupted public services like police, justice and social services. That compromises the care and support that survivors need and increase impunity for the perpetrators. To effectively address and prevent violence against women, a robust public health infrastructure is necessary because healthcare is, of course, more than a tool to fight violence against women. It is also their participation in public life. Just like in many crisis moments, women are the majority at the forefront of the pandemic as frontline responders in various capacities, especially nurses, and then also a lot of doctors, other health uh, healthcare professionals making critical contributions to address the pandemic. Ironically, they are also the hardest hit and at increased uh, risk of infection and loss of livelihood. In Maldives, women are on average um, equally or better educated than men, and 40% of households in the Maldives are also by women. While the government is considering various social uh, protection measures, including expanding social 
medical insurance issues for paid leave, extending unemployment benefits, differing loan payments, and support to business, it is likely that those most in need of support are currently not being reached. As peace builders, we employ innovative community approaches to resolve issues and hence have been playing critical roles in identifying and initiating preventive measures. While the government authorities established helplines and online counseling and psychosocial support, volunteers, civil society organizations and grassroots women's organizations and community units are using technology-based solutions such as SMS online tools and networks to expand social support and to reach out to women. We saw that pandemic situation was becoming a breeding ground for explo exploitation of vulnerable groups by extremists to spread a more conservative form of Islam, we saw that there were increased community violence and possibility of escalating criminal activities, including substance abuse, drug peddling, theft gang, resulting from an increase in unemployment or significant loss of income. We also saw opportunities to raise awareness on COVID-19 through social media by disseminating gender responsive messages and communication material on preventive measures for domestic violence, stress management, and how to respond to stigma, discrimination in human rights violation 19 and pre-existing stigma and discrimination while promoting community level solidarity. While the government established counseling services and helpline services for uh, gender-based violence victims, there were many addressing sexual and reproductive health and several issues with loss of lives related to this. Voice was raised by many of us calling out to ensure availability of information and services on family planning, safe maternal health services, and also to prevent diversion of healthcare resources at the expense of pregnant women. In short, as women peace builders and civil society actors, we are lobbying for women's participation in the development of a comprehensive and hosted COVID-19 response plan that goes beyond the immediate health response. The projections of World Bank and Asian Development Bank state that the future recovery of Maldives is bleak, as Maldives will have to compete with those countries with higher fatality rates to access international financial support. And this would mean compromising social sector to ensure the provision of immediate and essential services which then will translate into several public health issues, and especially for vulnerable groups, women and children. So responses to the health crisis should be carefully thought out to avoid further impacting the socio-economic sectors. And in order to continue the trajectory towards the 2030 agenda and make a sustainable development agenda and make tangible progress in achieving the sustainable development goals, we saw that uh, we know and recognize that our recovery from the pandemic must have gender empowerment. Women agency at its heart. No matter how bad a situation is, as uh, Madam Archana said, there are always positive outcomes. Similarly, this confinement also saw people discovering talents that they never thought they had as people's imagination and creativity emerged, shining through their posts on social media. We saw people's hopes, concerns, fears, frustrations, and reflections. While the experience of confinement was not pleasant, that also opened an unprecedented opportunity to reflect on our gender roles in the family and wider community. While COVID-19 may therefore represent a risk of increased domestic violence, it could also be delivering an opportunity to optimistically review current domestic roles and share the work and discover that when domestic roles are shared or halved, relationship is deepened and parenthood becomes a shared ple pleasure rather than a burden on one. We should use this time of confinement to abandon unequal gender roles and nurture family relations by sharing all experiences of life at home. If the future means greater sharing of responsibilities of domestic life, then more opportunities for women to continue to commercial and public life will open up to the benefit of the whole society. And more than ever, women should be present at the political table helping shape the government's response, contributing their perspectives in deciding which policies will best benefit both women and men in the recovery from such troubling times. We must not only endure the coronavirus, as Madam Martina said, but emerge as a powerful force with renewed vigor and transformation leading the recovery process. In order to effectively respond to these needs, structural and systemic weaknesses which enable underlying inequalities to persist will need to be addressed. I'm glad that this forum is held with academics and university officials because I would like to state that you are in a position to build and develop women's agency. Women's agency cannot be exercised without building women's self-efficacy. So as a university, 
courses can be developed with gender consciousness embedded within it, focusing on developing women's awareness of herself, her rights, and her self-efficacy, because without this critical consciousness, women will not be able to leverage her belief in her ability to fulfill her aspirations. So students, emerge from your university as people who are gender conscious and devoid of stereotypical patriarchal gender bias so that girls will emerge as equal partners and not as your servants and boys will emerge as a partner and not as a master. Thank you very much. Wow, that was really, really something which makes me want to stand up and clap for you. Uh, beautiful and what a way to end, you know, actually handing over the baton to the young and the responsibility to the professors to ensure that we have a more equity based, uh, you know, world where there is gender consciousness, respect and tolerance towards each other and inclusion, of course, how can we forget inclusion without inclusion? I don't think uh, it would work. Thank you so much, uh, Mariam, for this very inspiring speech. I don't know how to thank uh, each of the panelists, but uh, I will save time and I will now request our respondent, Josie, I'll just introduce her to take over and then, you know, she can sum it up. She can tell us uh, where this is going and what uh, she has learned from all these very, very uh, powerful speeches. Um, also, I just want to share before I start reading her uh, by data that I'm so, uh, you know, grateful to Josie. I just learned from Ashima this morning that Josie met with an accident, is bedridden, will not be using her uh, camera because uh, she is going to be lying down. She can't even stand. And despite that, her commitment is another great inspiration for all of us. And this is what we women can do and how we can change the world because we believe in what we are doing. So I'm going to just introduce her briefly and then I will ask her to take it forward. Um, one sec, please. Yeah. So uh, Ms. Josie Gardner is a peace researcher, community facilitator and healer committed to a more peaceful and just world. Josie is the managing editor of the Australian Journal of Human Rights, as well as a current PhD candidate and science scholar at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Josie's research investigates the connection between inner and outer peace through community-based research in protracted conflict contexts. Josie is currently partnering with Yagjak Reconciliation and Development Network to explore youth agency in creating emergent peace systems across Northwestern India. Previously, Josie co-founded and led impact research at Muraliso, a community arts and development social enterprise in Australia, and also pioneered a sustainable microcredit development initiative for HIV plus widows in Tanzania. With academia, Josie has been a tutor and guest lecturer in international relations and development studies, as well as a research led a lead in refugee policy research. Additionally, Josie has been a human rights case worker at Amnesty International Australia and has also engaged in fieldwork projects with communities around the globe from Nepal to Thailand. Josie is an innovator idealist and unorthodox thinker who is passionate about bridging divides through intergroup dialogue and holistic approaches that draw together the scientific, the spiritual, and the creative. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Josie, because your passion is uh, visible to us in your presence, despite your physical uh, ailment and your, uh, you know, your state physical state, but your mind is ticking and that is what is important. As they say, you know, even though the body is giving up, but your mind is going to stay and continue the fight. Please, over to you, Josie. Thank you so much, Ms. Kapoor, for your very kind introduction. And I'm so happy to be joining you all today. I'm um, really humbled and honored to be on the panel with such powerful women and um, really excited to contribute to this conversation. Um, 
And I want to first and foremost thank everyone, the organizers for this fantastic event and uh, to Ms. Kapoor for chairing and Dr. Narang for moderating and to Ashima um, for organizing this um, and all the presenters. This has been a really enriching conversation. Um, and I'm really excited also to have so many students here as though uh, students are really who inspire me the most often. Um, so I will just briefly summarize each of the presentations and then talk about some key threads that I've found running between them um, and then uh, perhaps pose a question or two to the speakers to respond to before passing it back to Dr. Narang to facilitate the student Q&A. Um, so I think um, Ms. Dharma Dasa, your presentation was fantastic about the Sri Lankan perspective uh, on the healthcare system and how COVID has uh, really given rise to emergent leadership from women. Um, and I think that your presentation really highlighted that women have played the most crucial role do during lockdown. Um, and the high recovery rate is really due to women's role in everyday care, formal, informal, voluntary work. Um, and I think this presentation really highlighted um, that women are really taking the lead, being innovative, using emergent leadership techniques, uh, and setting up really innovative systems in a time of crisis. Um, and I think that this is one of the key themes that I'll revisit later on. Um, especially uh, digital innovation and really using informal or no systems uh, when there are no systems in place, really sharing informal technologies. Um, Dr. Luna Casey, your contribution highlighted some really fantastic um, global trends actually grounded in Nepal and I think um, I think that this really speaks to so the experience of so many women worldwide right now um, during COVID uh, around gender-based violence and also unpaid domestic work uh, and the problems that this has caused um, and highlighted really uh, the existing systemic issues in gender equality. Um, in the, in the current system, not only in a policy sense, but also the way in which policy is grounded in cultural norms, um, which really highlights the need for new narratives. Um, so yes, we need gendered policies and yes, we need tighter legislation and better legislation to prevent domestic violence. But I think you also highlighted for us how we really need grassroots interventions at the level of the family and the community to be really addressing um, the narrative and cultural norms around domestic violence and, and unpaid domestic work um, and how these are grounded in patriarchal norms as you have highlighted for us. Um, and you've also highlighted uh, the important point that women need to be involved in policy making. Um, and I think all of the presentations have spoken to the importance of the, of it's imperative for women to be consulted in policy, but also in policy implementation. Um, I think this highlights another issue though, um, that yes, we need legislation and policy change, but when it comes to implementing these things in praxis, all of us here know too well that this does not necessarily match up, that you know, we can, create great legislation and policies, but when it comes to the level of the family and community, we may not be able to implement these things too well. So how are we building narratives at that level, at the grassroots level? Where exactly are the narratives failing? Where are the strongest and weakest links for this? Um, and Dr. Shakila, also thank you so much for sharing your perspective from the Maldives. I think um, you've highlighted again some really important social and economic challenges and some challenges that are also a lot of we've been dealing with for years, um, but also have been really highlighted during COVID um, implementation in healthcare. <clears throat> Um, and issues uh, exacerbated by internal migration, as you've mentioned, um, 
and uh, you know, heightened community violence, domestic violence, all of these issues that have really been highlighted during this uh, conference so far. Um, so I think that you've highlighted that legislation is really imperative and policy change is really imperative, but you've also spoken to um, the psychological well-being, the social well-being, um, and the way in which the weaknesses of the healthcare system and also impunity and law and order issues have really exacerbated um, the psychological and social burdens placed on women and how these are completely absent from the policy narrative. Um, and I think this has spoken again to women being innovative leaders, um, using mobile phones and social media, gender sensitive messaging, etc. Talents, creativity emerging in, in online communities. So again, this comes back to the, the innovative leadership. Um, and this again speaks as well to the, to narrative change and the level of the family and community as well as the legislative and policy change. Uh, so I think that's a recurrent theme as well here. Um, so this, you know, COVID presents a unique opportunity to review gender policies um, and also really review grassroots leadership as well um, and how that can be leveraged further. Um, so I think just to wrap this up, the central question that's really been emerging from all of the speakers, um, not just in today's session, but in previous sessions, are, is really that women are more likely to suffer the greatest economic and social impacts during crisis. Crisis. Um, and also that the pandemic has provided a golden opportunity to build something entirely new, um, that this pandemic is a leverage point, it is a rupture, it is a moment to radically reset, um, and we must do everything we can not to return to normal. This pandemic is demanding that of us uh, to do something radically innovative. Um, so, I think that the, the key theme here is really that women are natural leaders in times of crisis and always. Um, and this is really presented a monumental time to highlight when women's leadership uh, and the ways in which they're innovating. Um, so I think one of the key themes is how can we formalize these roles? How can we keep this momentum? How can we generate resources to support and sustain this kind of grassroots leadership? Um, and this begins really by highlighting these leadership roles and uh, which is one great facet of this initiative uh, and us having this conversation. Um, so one of the questions perhaps uh, back to the panel is how we can best highlight these emerging roles and skills in these voluntary and in informal ways. Um, and, you know, how do we leverage resources and policy to support emergent bottom-up initiatives? Who does the onus need to be placed on? And what is the role of grassroots leaders uh, to, you know, build sustainable narratives around this? Um, and the other thing I, I wish to highlight and pose to the panel as well is um, I think COVID is really a time for us to be asking new questions entirely. Um, this is, you know, COVID has provided perhaps the biggest setback to gender equality in our time. Um, but I also sense this striking collective energy and this conversation and drive to correct this and move through and beyond uh, to a truly new paradigm. So I think we must not think about this linearly um, as though we need to get back to a certain status of gender equality that we've had before the pandemic and forge forward again. I think we're being asked to do something much more radical and completely rewrite the script on gender equality, which requires innovation, which requires framing problems in a different way and asking entirely new questions. So I think what I would love to hear from the panel is um, perhaps from each of you, what is the question that we should be asking to, uh, you know, and whom should we be asking it to? Um, and from whom should we be seeking answers? 
Um, so I think crises like this really pre present a time to be thinking in a different way um, to make sure that we're not uh, forging ahead with the same narrative or backtracking too much. Um, so um, thank you so much again to the panelists for this really stimulating discussion and um, thank you so much to the chair, Ms. Archana Kapoor, and um, I will hand it back to the, to the speakers to answer the questions. Who should go first? Uh, thank you, Josie. Uh, I heard that uh, uh, you met with an accident and in spite of all odds that you are uh, participating and uh, giving your own viewpoints and critique in our webinar. So uh, can I move on to the questions now? Question now? Yes, uh, Shima ma'am. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, please go ahead. I think uh, Josie had posed the question to each of the panelists. Uh, Monica, do you think we should first get the panelists to respond to Josie's uh, question, which she has raised, and then move on to the Q and A? Yeah, Ashima, ma'am. Uh, yes, yeah, the question panel respond. by Josie. The panel respond. Okay. Okay. So let's follow the order. We can go to uh, Visakha ji first and then Luna and then Mariam so that we follow the same order. Uh, over to you, Visakha ji. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, how to keep the leadership, uh, you know, what we gain at this time? Um, uh, yes, uh, it, it is a very difficult uh, it's not the question is difficult, but it's very difficult to do because we do know when the conflicts, when there is armed conflicts, women take the center role. Uh, but when peacetime, the women are sent back to the kitchens. I mean, whether Chittagong Hill tracks, whether it's in Sri Lanka, everywhere, this is prevalent. So this is um, very important for us to find a strategy of keeping us in the leadership. But one thing about the women at the local level, especially if they are elected leaders and also the other leaders in the civil society, if we keep continuing work that we have done, and not necessarily only uh, during the lockdown, but in the normal census, but normally when the, when the system starts working, they are, it's difficult for us to penetrate ways and means of doing uh, that. Uh, of, of course, women have to help women. Uh, this is uh, one thing when she asked from whom, yes, it's from the women to the women, because we see as a woman working with women for like two decades, it's the women who don't vote the women, the women who really pull the women down. But that has to be changed. The sisterhood is extremely important, just like I said, we are South Asian sisters. So that sisterhood is extremely important to be built. And I think we can build it through the universities, ma'am. And that's why as Shakila very clearly told, having students around, getting these academic institutions on board with the civil society activists like us, it's extremely important because you set the tone and we carry it on the uh, ground. So let's really look at some way whether you can have some academic disciplines on this women's leadership. Uh, you, you know, something more concrete which we can take to the world and then back again to the society. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that. We have to build a sisterhood and it's important that we have to collectivize. I think that is uh, very important, so what you have said. Uh, over to Luna, please, for your response. How do we bring in leadership? Where do we go? Who do we speak with to sustain this whole momentum? Luna? Uh, okay. 
sorry. <laughs> I just forgot to, um, you know, on my video. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, uh, uh, Archana, for for this question. Uh, so, like, uh, you know, I because yeah, I was thinking about um, like uh, like more research is uh, needed to understand. Uh, to understand like how the intersecting identities of women uh, have you know affected them so i think uh, more re uh, so more you know like the complexity should be uh, unpacked because uh, everybody is not um, um, you know impacted uh, with this covid in a same similar way so so due due to the differences among women and differences among uh, our society uh, so more uh, you know understanding is needed uh, to know sense or to unpack those thinking uh, even uh, so I think and in this way we can better uh, build our policies so that you know all the voices are heard because uh, normally what happens is even women even though women are on the policy table uh, it's not uh, you know uh, the policies are not um, uh, you know, working for all women. So that's why what I would say is uh, it's very necessary and uh, the time has come that um, um, we should intersect uh, our experiences uh, um, and, you know, unpack this uh, complexity in order to uh, re rewrite gender policy. Yeah, and yeah, I, I would say, <laughs> so this is my thought. So revisiting, reimagining, and repositioning. Mm -hmm. I think right. uh, these are the three things that we need to look at when we talk about the gender policy. So what you are saying is revisit right. what we have done, reimagine our role, and then reposition right. ourselves in the front seat. So uh, right. thanks for that. And uh, now, Mariam, your response, please. Yeah. OK, I think, um, I think what has happened to us uh, due to this COVID is something completely unprecedented as uh, we have talked about. So uh, we are all still struggling to understand because there's not a single human being on this earth, not a single country on this earth that has not been impacted by it. And then obviously um, when we look at everywhere, we see women um, actually in leadership roles. You know, they have been uh, by default uh, in many cases pushed into these roles. Um, and then there are responses. Look at the, all the women leaders, those countries that actually have successfully managed this are led by women women leaders. Um, and then so obviously there's a lot for us to learn from what they did, their ability to listen, their ability to build relationships, their ability uh, to um, uh, to uh, be um, to, to have inclusive policies. So I I would think, you know, that we need to basically go and understand exactly um, what um, what were um, what, what led to their success. Uh, what led to the failures um, of those people who have failed or who have not succeeded yet, and then also um, uh, I know um, I, I I know that the COVID nineteen response requires also highest level of political commitment. So this means the same way we uh, to for us to um, build uh, women leadership um, and then come forward, uh, we also need. Uh, that kind of political commitment. This means we need to uh, use our um, skills and strategies and to be, uh, to try and get to that uh, decision-making table, uh, basically to sit there. I know we will feel, feel uh, we will face lots of challenges. We will probably be ignored. And yet I think we have the resilience and the energy and the drive and the motivation um, and the inspiration basically to sit there and then try to make a change. So I think we should continue our fight, continue our fight as women leaders and then not allow any of these challenges uh, bow us down. Thank you. Uh, well said, and uh, what is important is that, you know, the emphasis, Ashima, this is for you since you're working with universities, research and studies are the call of the time, and that, of course, we can look at later on. But now I would like to hand the floor to um, Dr. Monica Narang, who is going to moderate the whole session of Q&A.
Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as Archana Kapoor, ma'am. Uh, now, uh, we heard that enlightening and illuminating sharing of views by the learner speakers. Now the house is open for discussion also. Uh, but by the time I have two questions with me, uh, they are not addressed to any of the panelists, but uh, I'll just speak it out and it is open for or maybe Madam Mariam or uh, Dr. Livna, they can answer it. Uh, it is from Ridhima Mahajan. As education and employment are usually considered to be the most important ways of empowering women, but despite that knowledge, most of the society here in India wants girls, especially of the age 20 to 25, to get married. How do you expect us as women, as society, to fight that sort of pressure when men are usually expected to marry only when they are financially independent? So this is the question which is raised. So um, maybe Dr. Leona, Casey, uh, I think you can take up this question. Sorry, what was the last part? Uh, uh, what I was the last I'll part? I'll repeat that. Okay. Uh, I'll repeat the whole question. As okay, thank you so much. As education and employment are usually considered to be the most important ways of empowering women, but despite that knowledge, most of the society here in India wants girls, especially of the age 20 to 25, to get married. How do you expect us as women, as society, to fight that sort of pressure when men are usually expected to marry only when they are financially independent? So I think uh, uh, to this point, um, I, I see like, uh, you know, uh, the first question, uh, so the first uh, 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 question is that uh, um, there is also, you know, like the support, the, the girls need the support of the family because, uh, you know, uh, in our community, especially in South Asia, um, uh, like, you know, uh, still uh, girls are not independent like the Western world. So I think in this case, uh, uh, the family should come up very strongly uh, supporting their girls and, you know, educating their girls and educating even themselves uh, so that, uh, you know, they won't put the pressure on their uh, uh, girls to get married early and I think another aspect is that uh, girls should also you know there should be uh, you know a school education system which would you know um, educate uh, our society for example uh, about uh, you know like uh, about uh, uh, banning early marriages or you know um, uh, creating agencies uh, for, for for women and girls for, uh, and also the school system should uh, provide uh, more uh, awareness educations uh, so that you know uh, we have a more state uh, 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 protection system for 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 this type of issue and and i think like uh, uh, so when the girls are like uh, 22 or 25 like like you mentioned so i think even in that um, age uh, you know uh, yeah because you know that is all almost adult age so so what i would suggest that uh, they should uh, you know fight back uh, <laughs> uh, make their um, uh, agencies you know um, if if they are not interested to do so uh, there should be some reporting mechanism where they can raise their voices and and put on yes to to be secure yeah so i would suggest that <laughs> that's that's a good suggestion for right as well yeah my, my take is concerned on this question uh can i have my point on this yeah Whether yeah sure uh, what happens in the society that they, they are actually in some of the families not all there are some no. exceptions yes not all uh, that they are under that pressure that they should be married off because just to get relief from that responsibility uh, right so that's a good suggestion that there should be some reporting mechanism so that uh, because it depends upon the individual. Uh, right. If you don't, don't want to get, uh, say, um, be uh, caught in that mad life uh, right now as they want to be independent. So uh, uh, there should be some mechanism. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Leonard.
uh, uh, now we can have the next question this is also addressed to the all the panelists at but maybe uh, i can address it to can the can i barge in <laughs> yes can i yes 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 of course ma'am of course uh, yeah, no, no, to to answer the question that uh, uh, that was posed before, uh, okay. my personal opinion uh, through my research and experience is that you know I think we women are to blame for what is happening in this case, because we are the fifty percent of the population and we are responsible for raising the next fifty percent of the population. That's the men. We we women raise them. Why are we not changing that mind shift? Education system itself, still, if you go back and look, are still teaching books that have been developed um, based on uh, uh, based on long term, uh, based based on ancient uh, philosophies and based on um, a lot of uh, um, uh, based on the times when leadership itself, the concept of leadership developed. The concept of leadership developed uh, from through the through the um, through the cave cave age because those days women stayed at home and then uh, men go out for hunting. So basically it came to a stage where leadership, description of leadership use the same adjectives uh, as description of a, of, a, of a male. And then so this means like, you know, so, so uh, leadership is not associated um, with women. Um, so if a, if a woman, for example, uh, uh, um, exerts leadership qualities, suddenly she's seen as a, a male um, or, or seen negatively. So there is this sort of uh, uh, gender bias. In, in that sense as well. So I think we are to blame, education system is to blame. So we have to actually teach them uh, the right way of respecting women or, or uh, building the, uh, women leadership. Can I come in, please? Of course, ma'am, yes. Yes, yeah. please. I mean, I, I also posted in the chat box to tell that, yes, women have to be educated and not necessarily a regular job, but they have to have income. and. Uh, the issue is the people should understand that a girl is also a pride to the family. It's not only a boy. I, I, this is what happens. Families think that having a girl is a burden. If, if that particular notion of a girl being a burden is taken off by uh, telling them or by making them aware that girls do earn as much as boys. I mean, this is exactly, it's, it's, it's money, it's wealth, it's the family's prestige. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's not that simple because we are, I mean, in our societies, we come with all these um, traditions, not, I don't feel like even traditions, but all this thinking. So the girls have to prove that they are a pride in the family and their own destiny, I think they have to decide. It's not another man is going to decide their destiny. This is extremely important for women, even if you are married, to understand that it's your destiny and you have to decide. I'm not telling to fight with the husband, but you have to make it very clear that your destiny has to be decided by you. And also for the families, I mean, it's important even at schools, at the universities, for girls to understand to be a pride to the family and not thinking always that they are going to be having to another family, not their family. Now, this is the whole thing that we always say, ah, your place is in someone else's house. No, 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 this is my house, just as my brothers. That has to go to our heads. Then things will change, thank you. Yeah, I think the cultural socialization process will need to change. The whole cultural socialization process has to change. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I have another question. Uh, maybe uh, I can ask Dr. Maria uh, to answer the question. Uh, this is a question again from Ridhima Mahajan. She says, uh, she, she's, uh, sorry, she's asking, despite the clearing absence of women in leadership, uh, leadership roles, our politicians and bureaucracy have not been able to formulate gender sensitive policies. What would you suggest the way ahead for us to achieve that void in our policies? I could, I can, I can follow. I can follow what you said. I, I'll repeat the question. I'll repeat. 
she's asking, despite the glaring absence of women in leadership roles, our politicians and bureaucracy have not been able to formulate gender sensitive policies. What would you suggest the way ahead for us to achieve that void in our policies? Well, again, um, well, again, it is uh, it is a mind shift change. So uh, in order for us to basically bring in this again, um, it's a fight. You see what happens is, as I mentioned before, uh, um, uh, the uh, current leadership philosophy um, uh, some, somehow stresses that women's interactive styles and attributes are um, advantageous and valuable to modern working cultures, modern management and leadership to cultivate team-based relationship-oriented management tactics for uh, uh, competitive advantage. And yet, uh, as you said, you know, somehow these policies are not coming through. Uh, what happens is, uh, um, I think we as women need to stand up and stop our own defamation also stop victimizing ourselves and we should begin to believe in ourselves our strengths and our self efficacy and become confident and comfortable with who we are as women so uh, in in order to prove to men or in order to 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 uh, um, to stand up to our rights because what happens is um like there's a double bind there's a double bind when it comes to uh when it comes to uh, uh judging women's ability and and so it is a hard road for us basically to be able to uh sit there and then include these policies thank you madam yeah, so, um, so as I mentioned before, you know, through a multifaceted and inclusive approach, together with the teachers and policymakers, we can transform the mindsets of uh, young kids from infancy and help eliminate all these internalized uh, repressive stereotype mindsets uh, and discriminatory stigmas that view women um, as an oppositional force. And that is actually what is basically preventing these kind of policies getting in there. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, yes, I have another question. This is a question from uh, Dipanki Kapoor. And uh, I'll do you only, ma'am, Mariam, Dr. Mariam. My question is that we've discussed how it is not considered important for women to be financially independent. I think it is the best time to spread awareness about how both men and women being financially independent can bring monetary stability for the family in such uncertain times. If the men lose their job but are not the sole earner of the family, how can we spread this message on large scale? I, I, I couldn't hear at all because there's a there's a disruption in the line. Okay, okay. I'll uh, ask again. This is a question to you, Alima. Uh, we've discussed how it is not considered important for women to be financially independent. I think it is the best time to spread awareness about how both men and women being financially independent can bring monetary stability for the family in such uncertain times, if the men lose their jobs but are not the sole earner of the family, how can we spread this message on large scale? Again, again, we are talking of. Um, I, I still didn't hear uh, uh, clearly, but then, but then again, we are talking about. Um, um, I think with the little bit that I heard, I think we are talking about uh, bringing a mind shift, change, a complete, a total transformative thought. You know, there's a, a not to collectively bring about this attitudinal shift to create a conducive environment for women to work and especially at uh, top leadership positions. Women have proven that they have in, in them to lead countries and companies. Sri Lanka is a fantastic example of that. Women's uh, participation commercially, politically and socially is important. After all, exclusion of women robs our nation of a valuable resource uh, and has high opportunity 
key costs that continue uh, basically to translate into billions of dollars in economic productivity. It is principally damaging uh, from, uh, from a human uh, capital disinvestment that also affects women's equal equality of life and, uh, and robs uh, women of their rights to realize their full potential. So basically, uh, basically, all we need is through education and through uh, transformative thoughts and through parenting to change the mind shift. This is what every, every question that has been asked is basically boiling down to that. And as even Visaka mentioned, you know, like, you know, we need to, we, we need to, um, we need to do the right thing by ourselves for us to be able to bring them forward. Uh, uh, we need to change the mind shift of the boys to think of girls as equal and as not as oppositional forces, you know, like, you know, we are, God has built us as two halves. And unless these two halves come together, we can't be complete. Yes. Because men think differently, women think differently. If, if I'm asked to jump over a wall, or if I'm asked to go to the behind the wall, I might choose to go over the wall, or, or uh, the other person might go around the wall, but then we are actually achieving the same target. So the way that women and men, because of our biological differences, we think differently, but nevertheless, we achieve the targets. So this is the kind of thinking that needs to be ingrained um, in, in, um, in educating the children from infancy through adulthood. Uh, and I think, ma'am, uh, during this COVID timing, uh, the uh, women and the girls, they have learned uh, too much because while doing everything from home, many of the realities are before them as, and we are talking about the equality because uh, at this time uh, that transformation is being done as per the circumstances as per the situation as i as i feel thank you so much ma'am yeah. uh, it might bye. be by default it might be by default at the moment but what happens when it comes to normalcy you know whether this kind of thinking would still stay you know whether the men earn or the women earn if they share the duties and if they share the um, sh share the um, share the work then it doesn't matter who earns just because a girl earns doesn't mean that you know it is uh, it is an inferior uh, inferior way of uh, earning you still have the same money but then, so why can't the men share the duties of my, why can't the men be the house husband and the women to work? Why so, should it be seen as a negative uh, um, um, element in the whole of our existence? But we've seen that equality during lockdown timing because since the, yes. the, the work was being done uh, by themselves only. So the men, they That's have been saying. So this was That's what I'm saying. Media but is it sustainable? Is it sustainable? Is what I'm saying. In future, let's is it going hope, to be sustainable? Let's hope so. Let's hope so. That it let's hope so. Let's hope so. We <laughs> must always hope for the best. Oh, yes, we should hope for the best. Thank yes. you, Dr. Maria. Thank you so uh, much. Um, Dr. Maria, can I come yes. in? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Sashmi. Yeah, I was reading uh, Snigda's uh, comments in the chat, and uh, I have a similar concern and uh, you know I was also thinking I'm also confused that in the 60s the 70s the 80s we were asking these same questions in 2020 we are still asking about these questions so uh, why haven't we why isn't the world the policies the decision makers even women when they got into political leadership have not been able to convince the world that Women are not lesser uh, than men, and they're very, and they are also equal pillar of the society. Uh, Visaka and Maria, we, you know, we all have been fighting. We're still fighting for the four pillars of 325. So, where does the gap lie? And I also want to ask Luna, you know, as a young researcher, as a younger. Uh, next generation of women from Nepal and she has uh, you know witnessed how women have been participated in the political movement uh, in Nepal yet you know they fall somewhere uh, in uh, becoming invisible after after um, the democratic processes were over so uh, where is the gap you know, in 2020, we're still asking the same questions. Um, anybody can come in, Visaka, Maria, Maluna. 
Can I come in? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the thing is, we also do have to appreciate what we have achieved. Uh, yes, we have asked it in 1960s, 70s, 80s, and you now here, but we also have, have achieved. That's for sure. I mean, we can't forget our achievements. Uh, women in politics throughout the world, women in corporate sector, uh, women are more out uh, than before in the 1960s. If you take, if, if definitely a job for a woman will be not, uh, no, you have enough to eat at home, no job. But now it's different. So there is a slow progress, it's moving. But also having said all these, we also do have to understand society the way that we all, it's, it's a human society is built because we have got an added responsibility as women that men don't have of childbirth. Now this, we can't really forget this because this is exactly what we are given to bring up a good child to the society. That is extremely important. So forgetting that we can't jump. We have to remember that responsibility of our future, producing children together with the man and getting the man to walk that journey of bringing up the child. So a lot has to be done also by the women. Because I really didn't want um, for us to tell, yes, we are uh, going moving forward, but not to forget to balance the public and private life. Because it's extremely important for a family to be happy, for the society to be happy. So how, looking back, if you are unhappy with your children's behavior for the society, then it's a big mistake. So it's extremely important as women and men to walk that journey together. We can't go ahead without each other, as very correctly Shakila was telling, yes, we do think differently. We bring different strengths and weaknesses. And those are the ones which really moves this world. Women, we are a little worried to take risks. Men do take risks. I mean, you keep a girl and a boy, a small children of five years near a, uh, I mean, this is not true for everybody, but normally in a swimming pool, boys tend to jump. Women will think a little and then slowly take the step to the water. This is why that we save money, men don't save money. So what we have to learn is to use these strengths and weaknesses and balance them and be, build a society. And we are heading, I mean, women in 1961, we had a woman to head our country. So in 60s, she was there heading the country. You had a prime minister who was very powerful. Indira Gandhi, I mean, the world knows her. So it's, it's not that we have not moved. It's not, but it's the women as, as quite correctly, I think Archana uh, uh, told, wrote uh, that in the chat box, women also have to give the room for women. And that's why I said when Josie asked the question, it's by us, to us. The question is not the other. We have to do it. Thank you. Um. Okay. Um, yeah. So, like you know, uh, like uh, Ashima uh, said, uh, why still in uh, 2020 still we are having the same question. So, what I think is, you know, uh, yeah, like you know, like there have been a lot of empowerment um, programs and policies and gender equality policies, and still. Uh, even if we look at women, peace and uh, security uh, uh, resolutions, uh, uh, even to, uh, it's already been like 20 years which uh, has, uh, that resolution has been passed. And even, even still uh, today, we still are uh, looking for the same question. Okay, where is the women? So what I feel is that, you know, uh, what uh, we are, uh, uh, so, you know, uh, we are not, we are, what sort of empowerment model we are following is, it's not to overcome the patriarchy, but to cope and adjust with the patriarchy, you know. So, so until, uh, you know, we overcome or we totally dismantle the system, I think this will be coming back again and again. 
um, uh, so I can give you some examples like um, you might have heard a lot of uh, stories about uh, Nepal's parliament, you know, like uh, uh, how the, uh, the the constitution assembly was uh, successfully able to bring um, around 33% uh, of the women after in the post-conflict uh, era. Uh, and then, you know, what those uh, politicians were talking about was uh, whenever like, you know, men feel that uh, women are threat or they are challenge challenging the norms, uh, so they, you know, then they are pulled down. So what happened just recently, uh, maybe, I don't know if you have uh, heard about this uh, news uh, about uh, uh, a foreign woman, you know, who was ma who married a Nepali man and then she was a leader, uh, leader and uh, suddenly, you know, like she was very smart. She was challenging the norms and, and suddenly they changed the citizenship sister, uh, citizenship uh, law. And then they said that now the, uh, you know, for the foreign women mar marrying a Nepali man would need a seven years uh, to, you know, uh, to be able to be a Nepali citizen. So, so, you know, so it's, it's really very hard uh, the question. And uh, of course, uh, we can do that, but still, you know, uh, what I what I found also in my research when I was doing with uh, women combatants who were uh, who went into the war who challenged those uh, gender orders and you know gender relationship and they uh, took those men's role they fought the war and when they were back uh, you know they were again pushed back to the traditional roles uh, yeah so and, and and it's really um, yeah you know uh, so. It's, it's really hard to say that uh, uh, even the policy uh, change in the policy could uh, uh, overcome this one. But yeah, the fight must go on and we need, I don't know, maybe more women's movement and more, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, voices uh, to the street. So what I feel is still we are, you know, just coping with the patriarchy and trying to adjust with that, trying to tolerate with that, rather than, you know, pulling that down. So yeah, so and if this continues, uh, this will be, you know, going on for maybe 50 years or so. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I feel that way. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I have another question. Uh, I think this is a question for uh, uh, Madam Vishaka. It is from uh, Jocelyn Kaur that surely a need to bring a mind shift. But how can we do that when we have elders who, ha who uh, were raised a different way, who were raised a different way, who are not willing to accept the fact that women have a role outside kitchen and children. Thank you. I mean, uh, sometimes I, I, I mean, I uh, think um, the whole thing of this, we were brought up this way, we have to do this and we can't change. I don't believe this because if you really take the generations, take the generations like 70s, even the words that the elders use. I mean, the, there's a lot of new words have come and those have, we have absorbed those words in our day-to-day -day vocabulary. So um, it is being adamant and not wanting to change. It's not that uh, you, you can't change them, you can, because people do, people, everything evolves and human being is one of the good, best example of change. It, it's a matter of number one education that's extremely important the education is extremely important because i mean india we always tell example of indian women how forward they are i mean you really have challenged very deep seated traditions of your country when it even come to your religion i mean leave alone we will be hesitant to go there, you know, though Sri Lanka is very forward, still when it comes to religion, we'll be hesitating. But you have challenge, especially in Savari Malaya, I mean, I mean, all these religion places. It's not that Indian women have not taken that stuff. You have taken and you have fought it. So it's, uh, it's the education, it's the awareness. And that's why I was telling this combination of academics 
and the practitioners is a unique combination to really put this right. Thank you. Thank you, Vishakha. Uh, can, uh, um, can I just uh, uh, put in a few words? Of course, ma'am. Yeah, uh, you see, um, also apart from uh, what Visaka mentioned, which I totally agree, we also must respect uh, that women, that woman uh, within us that is battling for um, expression. Uh, we must uh, understand and accept that nobody gives us power. We seek it, we give it, and we take it. So we have to we have to accept that, um, and as women professionals uh, or women peace builders or women fighters, whatever we call it, we have to learn to handle uh, both with uh, equanimity and emerge stronger from them rather than allow them to uh, basically swamp us down. Our workplace will continue to be a battlefield with intangible weapons. Our professional journey. Um, by taking us through a mixture of happiness and sadness, success and failure, comfort and pain, encouragement and frustrations, love and hatred, relief and struggle. We will encounter all these anxieties um, or face disappointments um, or plenty of opportunities to get angry, stressed or offended. Uh, it may take us down by great storms and bumpy roads and several times it may show us to the edge. But these challenges are what makes life interesting for us, what makes life meaningful for us to prepare us for future. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I have another question. Uh, Monica, this should be the last question because uh, we are already, it's 12.53. So if okay. you don't mind, can this be the last question? Ma'am, this will be the last question. Again, uh, the, uh, uh, this is a question from Sandigda. She hasn't addressed to any of the panelists, so um, I keep the question open if anyone can, any panelist can answer, even the, ch even the chair. Uh, she said that why do we always have to highlight that we have these many women at the top? Why is not a normal thing that men and women as both very important for the society, family and the economy? I think this has already been addressed in a certain way in the responses. I think Mariam spoke a lot about it that, you know, it's like half and half, 50%. But still, if anybody wants to respond to it. Yeah. I think it has been spoken, isn't it? Okay, now uh, we can move on then. Uh, Thank you, all the panelists. Uh, now I again invite the chair to give your ma'am final comments, observations, perspectives on what these esteemed speakers they have shared. Yes, Arjuna. Thank you so much, Dr. Monica, and thank you to each one of the panelists. It's been so. Uh, uh, I would say it is on and we are not going to let go. I think that is very important because we will continue until we have women like Ashima, Mariam, Luna, Visakha and many more who are part of this whole international webinar, webinar, we can feel that there is somebody who will fight for us and we can join them. So that option is there. When you look at leaders, there was a question about leadership. I think here are your leaders in these six days, choose whichever one you want and keep the battle going, that's one. The second thing which I want to highlight here is that, see, uh, it's not only because you're born a woman, it's how you've been nurtured because the discrimination happens from the very beginning. You know, you are told that girls don't cry. You are told, give this to your brother. You know, the boy's birth is celebrated. So many things are done. So this is part of, in India, as we say, the Sanskriti, so-called Sanskriti. And I'm afraid that uh, with the kind of governments we have and with the kind of uh, mindsets which we are seeing out in the open, women are going to have a, a very tough time. And we have fight this battle and stand up for leave a room in silence they should be seen but not heard here i have told my daughter you should always be heard 
whether you're seen or not. In a webinar, even if your mic is closed and you have something to, your uh, camera is not on, but you have something to say, please say it. Because that's very important. You should be Another thing is that you, these children are asking that the fight is still on. Just imagine in the state, would these girls have, or in the or in 80 to use smartphones to even have fought all through because of, as Luna said very well, the complexity, uh, complexities of the social fabric. That is why the, the, you know, we have kept, we keep pushing. The battles are changing. The battlefronts are changing. We were first fighting for education. Today, so many girls are part of the law faculty or part of Jammu University. Earlier, we were fighting for, you know, being allowed to stay out till dark. Today, women are going. They have, the, they have a lot of freedom. I would say that, you know, now we are fighting for more things. We are fighting for a place in politics. We are fighting for a place in the, in the boardroom. We are fighting for, our, for becoming editors in newsrooms. So the, the kind of the fight has changed. It's continuing. But what we are fighting for has changed considerably. You are not fighting, as Vishakaji said, for equal food. You have a right to food. You have a right to education. This is in your constitution. And this has happened because of a number of women who have fought for us. And we will keep fighting, and this fight is forever. Let me tell you, it's not going uh, going away easily when you have only 11% or 4% women in parliament, or you have only 12% women in boardrooms. Then, of course, it's a long battle. So that is one thing which I wanted to highlight here. The, uh, the other thing is I just want to share a little about me. You know, we don't even have an idea of the kind of privileges that we are living in. Look at the large number of women who have left the villages, who do not have access to internet, who do not have access to education. I think that the, that the girls in the universities have to now start fighting for them and get them rights because when you fight for other people's rights, you also will benefit in the long run. And I think now is the time when the young start fighting for the underprivileged and the marginalized in our countries. And I think that is very important. I work Ivat, which is one of the Innu, the most backward uh, district in the country. It's an aspirational district. Now that's a new word earlier. It was backward. Now it's aspirational. And in the 115 aspirational districts, Mewat is at the top of it, where, you know, we are, we are, we are faring so low on all social parameters, whether it's education, health, water, sanitation, and everything. So these are some of the things that we need to, uh, we may say that we don't even realize that women have to walk miles for water. But yes, it's a reality, and they do, and at the cost of their safety, security, their productivity, and a number of other things. So we as women, will have to start thinking about other women. Again, I'm borrowing this line from Visakha Ji that it's about us, for us, and with us. You know, so that is how we will democratize this whole process and bring in more women in this battle. Uh, having said that, um, as I'm the chair, I'm not going to take much time about talking about myself, but what I have learned today from this very eminent panel, I'm just going to wrap up, although Josie did a great job, but what are the takeaways of this session? Some of the challenges are, and I'm not going to attribute this to uh, any of the panelists because I may um, commit a mistake there. But one of the things which hit home uh, was, and I think this is very important for even research and taking this conversation forward, is data, access to data, and the honesty and truthfulness of data. I think this is something that we all need to start looking at because we cannot deny the fact that we are living in a digital world. And this is going to be the new norm for several years till you know what we talk of normalcy will ever come back, not come back. Like one of the biggest social media organizations I was reading yesterday has asked its employees to work from home till July, 2021. Now, when you're working from home, you do need internet, you do need access to data, you do need, you'll be doing, you'll be using the digital space a lot. Now, some of the researches don't even come out. And I think if I'm not mistaken, Luna had mentioned this, that data and its access and the honesty of data is very important, even to 
find out how women have been impacted. I don't know when this study will actually happen, uh, when we'll start studying about how jobs have been lost, how women have faced this, because right now everybody's in lockdown or semi-lockdown or semi-unlockdown. So these are some of the things which we will have to wait and see. We are only listening. It's a lot the same. Another thing is, uh, although yes, education is not your panacea for all your ills, but yes, it's very important because clearly Nepal, India, and Sri Lanka, when we look at it, Sri Lanka has a 98% literacy rate. We have a 58% in women and Nepal is also not too far. I think that education has been flagged as one of the major challenges, uh, the, the equity and equality in the education, which is one of our SDG goals also is very important. Another thing is that we don't recognize the consequences of the domestic violence on health and productivity, on your self-esteem, on your mm -hmm. confidence, and a number of other issues which can uh, contribute fully to whatever they are doing, even as mothers, as uh, labor, as, uh, as you know, uh, the, the, in various sectors, wherever they are. So we have to look at that aspect from the point of view of health. And we don't talk about mental health at all. You know, we know what has happened in Jammu and Kashmir. We know what people are going through. We don't even have enough counseling centers. I'm talking about Mewat, where domestic violence is really huge. It's really rampant. Every second house has a girl who's come back, has been thrown out of her uh, uh, in-law's house. But there are no counselors. And we are doing a project for three years with a humble uh, grant from a foundation on just providing a space for women to come and talk. They don't even have that flexibility to go and talk in the neighbor's home. And we've seen this even in Jammu and Kashmir when there have been attacks and women have lost their near and dear ones. They don't go to the other because of fear of being judged. So, you know, basically we need to look at some of these issues when we talk about some of the challenges because we do not have that sisterhood which has been mentioned so many times in today's panel. We need to reach out and that's what how I started. We need to reach out to those who we feel. Another thing is, of course, we've talked about gender in sharing of household chores, gender in various other issues. And I think that is something that I would really like to flag where and here I would also like to state that when we talk about women, 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 I think we are as it is isolating 50% of the population who actually we look as perpetrators. So what we do when we talk about domestic violence is we always include the men. So we say that peace begins at home, men included. If the men are not included, then how, who are we talking? We are talking in an echo chamber and our own voice keeps coming coming back to us. So I'm very happy that a lot of male students have joined these panels and it's good to see them there. Even if they have not asked a single question, I'm, I'm, I'm presuming that they're going back with some takeaways. All the questions were asked by women. This is something that we need to make a note of that, you know, why don't men participate in these discussions? It is their problem more than our problem. And I think in every discussion and Ashima and all of you, I'm requesting you, uh, I have been to in a home ministry, we were talking about the left wing extremism and there were 49 men and I was the only woman. And, you know, I thank the home secretary for inviting me because as you saw in my CV, I work in various areas, conflict zones. And I thanked when my turn came in and I was asked to introduce, I said, I don't have an introduction because my introduction, I'm representing 50% of the population here. Where do I start with? And I'm so grateful that at least somebody remembered to invite one woman. And you know, then they tried to make a joke because they were all men saying that, oh, you are good enough for 49 men. No, no, it was by choice that you chose to ignore us. And yes, I will compensate for that entire 49 women when I speak with you. And that is what is going to make us, you know, when we speak, we have to be very firm in what we are saying and never be afraid. As somebody said, never be afraid of asking a question. And this is what I'm going to say to the men in this panel as attendees, that please ask questions because it is important for you too. So another thing which came out is, that you know the fear of losing jobs and opportunities. And that is something which keeps women inside. Because you know, they don't speak up because they're so scared that nobody will listen to them. And now in the pandemic, this is going to be more. Because one of the challenges of the 
pandemic is that when you have only 20 class, when so many companies have closed down, jobs have uh, shrunk, then it's the men who will be given priority. Even when you see when a loss in a family happens, the first choice is get the boy a job and not the girl. Whereas maybe the girl is better. So these are some of the challenges that we all have to address. And of course, we've talked about the social structures and the, and, and you know the, the silos that we all work in. Another very important point which was raised by Mariam was the fear of extremists taking over this space because there's a lot of vacant space now because the leader is involved in other things. There was a lot of open ground. And this is something which was only touched upon but I think it is very important but when we talk about peace we also talk about peace in conflict zones we talk about peace in extremist zones we talk about peace in our lives as a whole we are seeing some bomb blasts unfortunately Beirut we have witnessed that it's not a conflict but still you know that those kind of figures make us uh, sadden us quite a bit and we need to look at peace for all. So that is something. So what are our recommendations? And I'm, I'll be very happy if our panelists can also join in because uh, I'm taking these recommendations from what we have uh, spoken and heard and maybe not always correct. So please, uh, after I mention them, if you want to add, we can also put it on the chat or we can share it with Ashima later. What I was thinking is that some one very platform, or we call it a response platform, or we call it a rehabilitation process, or however we want to term it, women have to come to the fore. Now the question is how? So there is going to be a recovery and response system in every country, and we need to be in those platforms. And that is something where we can look at writing a common document, document, writing a white paper and sharing it with either a body, a UN body or, or in your own country. How do we do that? That is very important. The second thing is what I want to highlight is, but sponsors are local. So each one of us has to look at what we can do locally. The global change will come in much later. But how can we reach out to our local sisters, to our local, um, you know, networks and look at change there? So because I run a community radio, which is a hyper local media, I see the value in going local, in speaking a local uh, dialect and in talking about local issues. And I think that's very important. And again, I'm going to go back to what Visakha ji said, that you know, little, little things of your essential goods are coming or your PDS is. So the, the solutions are very local. The problem may be, glo uh, may be uh, global or global, however you look at it. So that is something very important. Another thing which um, I would like to highlight here, all solutions have to do with livelihood. So when we look at solutions, we should also look at livelihoods. Because it is the women who are losing jobs, it's the women who are going to sit at home, it's the burden is going to come on women. So we must look at enhancing livelihood solutions for women so that they can carry on with it. And masks was discussed. Uh, my NGO itself has produced 52,000 masks in the last three months, made by women and distributed to the local self-government. Uh, we paid six rupees per mask. So at least the Eid and you know we had two Eids uh, one on May 24th and one as recent in July. So at least for that, women could celebrate this because money was going directly into their hands, into their accounts with access only to them. So we need to look at more livelihood solutions. We need to talk about nutrition for women. I think these are some things which we could not discuss because of so many other things that were being discussed. But when we keep women at the center, we have to look at and lively uh, options. We have to include them in the recovery uh, discussions and solutions. We have to talk to them in a dialect that they understand and do not get overwhelmed. Even a farm uh, labor can contribute because she will tell you how she has coped with COVID in these four months. Uh, one more thing is that, you know, we need to, and this I'm flagging for all of you who are doing research, we need to look at the most marginalized populations and how they have been impacted, whether it is refugees, we've not talked about 
Bangladesh. We talked about them. We haven't talked about the inter internally displaced persons. I have visited so many camps in so many countries. We have not talked about them. How have they coped with it? So there is a very urgent need to look at unorganized refugees, uh, migrant laborers, unskilled laborers who did not even have the uh, the power to negotiate with their employees, uh, with their employers on simple basic. Um, uh, you know, compensation for this kind of they don't leave, they don't get, get anything. So to build on collectives to strengthen the bargaining and negotiating power of the most marginalized people. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, this has also come up that, you know, there is a lot of existing strength in women networks. Globally, we can join hands we can pressure the SDG action platforms. We need to link SDGs to today's situation and to the most marginalized vulnerable people, whether it's health, poverty, quality, equity, everything together, decent work. So I think that is where some kind of pressure, and I'm happy to be part of it because we are working with UNESCO and UNICEF, where we can draw the attention of the UN organization onto SDGs and bring women into that kind of discussion. And lastly, we've shared, uh, we've talked about it. There is a need to reimagine, uh, rediscover, reinvent, rebuild, and then reposition the role of women in development, in health, only for themselves, because a woman's health and well being leads to a family's health and well being. So, with these words, uh, I think uh, this is uh, some of the suggestions. We have academicians here. The research is very important. We have politicians here. They can start talking about the policy level. We have civil society activists and the people who believe in the cause of women who can take it forward. And we have lawyers. They can be the most helpful in helping us draft these kind of uh, white papers and uh, position papers, policy papers, and taking it forward. Uh, thank you so much. I am, I'll be very happy if any one of our panelists wants to add to this before we kind of wrap up. Uh, and I want to thank uh, each one of you and particularly Josie, what a way she wrapped everybody's conversations. I can't even think, start to think how, how much pain she must have been in with an accident so raw and lying on bed. But uh, as I said earlier, I'm saying it again, these are the women who we can feel very proud about, who will take our battles forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashima, for this opportunity. But I leave it to our panelists. Uh, Visaka, I would like you to add something. It's not about me, it's about the whole panel. So if you have something to say, one one sentence from each one of you to add to this wrap up and some ideas. Uh, I would like to thank everybody. Uh, it's a wonderful session and especially having the students around, I, I think it makes uh, it much more uh, lively and also the feeling that we are taking something uh, uh, to the future. Uh, what I really would like is, as I told you, uh, it's the women who have to take the lead. And the other thing is uh, for us to have, um, have this relationship uh, between the academics and the practitioners. You... Uh, we practice it on the ground. I think that's an ideal way of uh, making the change, the transformation that we all are looking forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Mariam, would you like to say something? Um, well, um, I think I have talked more than enough, but then um, I would say that, you know, uh, learn to embrace uh, our feminine values uh, and enjoy as a woman work as a woman, make the most of life's opportunities and learn from every opportunity and challenge uh, that life brings along uh, just by being a woman. That's it. Thank you. Fabulous. Fabulous. You know? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Archana, for your such a uh, inspiring uh, ending note and it's it's really inspiring like you know I was just uh, uh, listening to it uh, so cautiously and 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 really uh, this was a very good learning uh, platform and thanks for all uh, the great uh, speakers and especially Asima uh, it was really nice to see her after I don't know how many years <laughs> in this way uh, and yeah so what I would say is that uh, <clears throat> 
yeah, of course, like uh, we talked about uh, still why we are raising the same question, but uh, then I started thinking because change in ha change is happening because of the fight we are putting on and uh, we challenge those, you know, um, um, norms uh, and yeah, and, uh, and, and I think, uh, yeah, transformation is possible and it is happening and yeah, and we should uh, keep our feminist uh, lens on and, and yeah, and I would like to wish all um, the team a very good um, day and for me it's night. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm sorry for keeping you up so late. Thank you so much. Uh, Ashima, I would like you to say a few words uh, because you are the spirit behind this whole uh, you know, uh, session. Mm. And I, I forgot to thank Muskan who uh, kicked off our session. So I did write in the chat, but thank you so much Muskan uh, for being there and, and vibrancy into the very start, you know, it's always a tool. Thank you, Archana. Um, uh, this was a excellent uh, session, and so many uh, points came up, uh, which we will be. I I'm sure uh, you know we'll have a conversation with the panelists in the next two sessions, and we will point out to them if they can raise some of those areas that you have mentioned. So there are still two days to go and the valedictory and I'm sure uh, many of these, uh, you know, marginalized communities and the impact that the COVID had on them will uh, come up. So thank you so much. And uh, Visaka, Luna and Mariam, you were brilliant. And, uh, I, you know, I'm sure this is a uh, ongoing conversation. We'll continue to have the dialogue with the students, especially the law faculty in Jammu University. They have a critical role to play. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's been an inspiring session. I'm sure the students, especially the girls, you know, they, they come from different backgrounds and, uh, you know, where certain social cultural norms. But sure, today they have been inspired by all of you ladies. We need to tell them that it wasn't easy for us also, you know. Uh, we had to fight to keep these struggles on. And that is where uh, the difference uh, would be made. But Josie was excellent and that's why we are doing this project together. It's really, really critical to rethink our uh, whole uh, approach and understanding as to what kind of questions we need to now ask. So thank you so much. Thank you, Archana. This was brilliantly moderated. Thank you so much. And uh, we will bring you again. We need to listen to Mewat's story and the stories of the women that you have been, you are working with. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Monica, ma'am. Uh, Thank you, Ashma, ma'am. Now, can I take over now? Yeah, sure. Yes, of course, it's all your. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, first of all, I... Ma'am, I was just uh, uh, looking up your, your profile and all. Uh, you've given voice to the voiceless. So uh, that's a wonderful job that you've done. And uh, in your presentations, you've already shared this thing that we have to use this crisis of this COVID-19 as a tool for transformation. Uh, and women are doing their extra jobs rather than their routine work. Academicians are there, they are writing their articles, their books, and they are, so they are focusing on the thing that which they were, say, uh, unable to do at that time because, because of moving out and all. And so while remaining in the homes, they are not uncomfortable. They are uh, utilizing their time for better purposes. Coming to uh, Madam Vishaka, uh, she ta she's uh, talked about the, about the mothers that, that they, now they need to take all necessary uh, steps 
uh, the common practices of uh, the healthy practices we have been in the habit of say uh, boiling water and all because of certain diseases which were already there like ebola then we we have faced that h1n1 i i remember that we used to wear masks also we used to keep sanitizers and all in order to uh, make prevent uh, prevent from this uh, disease but now since uh, this disease has come the we have to protect ourselves and many of the practices which you share that we, uh, now the uh, journal in generally we are following that so uh, thank you for sharing this then coming to dr leona uh, you, you talked about that many women are forced to live with their abusers and the perpetrators and there's a it's very disappointing that the that uh, not any response is there from the government but uh, it's really very discouraging but there are certain rescues also you talked about that helpline number 1149 uh, for women there and then the therapy sessions and the uh, and other things which which would help them in the crisis as as well as in the normal life also so uh, especially you talked about the leadership and the challenges that they have to face so ultimately uh, they have to be come uh, come in equality with men then coming to dr mariam shakila say you shared with us that this covid crisis is not only the health health issue it is affecting all the sectors of the society uh, like it is leading to vulnerabilities then uh, some of the environment problems then we have the women's uh, ineffective productive life and violence against women unemployment and all so to come out of all these uh, discrepancies and all these deficiencies and to work uh, along with men as per the uh, say circumstances then the um, madam josi miss josi gardner in spite of all the odds that you have shared your views and you have participated in our international webinar and you uh, given us uh, summed up everything in a beautiful manner thank you ma'am so i again thank the madam chair uh, madam arjuna kapoor then uh, i thank uh, madam vishaka darmadas i thank dr leona kesi i thank mariam shakila i thank miss josi gardner for uh, uh, being a part of our international webinar so tomorrow uh, onwards we have the fourth day of this international webinar there will there will be technical session 2 on this covid 19 gender and ecologies of care reimagining national policy for women now before winding up i would like to request the student coordinator to please uh, take the pic of this international webinar and i request all the participants and the attendees to please switch on their video so that the uh, host can take the uh, pick of this uh, today's international webinar today's session so please ashima ma'am is that done muskan are you there bachche muskan yes ma'am yes, it's done yes now my session for to uh hope the covid times keep us all safe and healthy thank you so much thank you now we close this thank you so much dr narang thank you so much for uh, a lovely you. moderation and being so patient with everyone thank you thank you thank you, thank you. everyone thank, thank you. you thank you ashma thank you thank you, thank you everyone bye thanks